We're uh, really pleased today to present as part of our First Nations Home Energy Save program an introduction to the Energy Step Code. And um, we've got a couple of great presenters uh, to talk about it and really uh, to help provide some of the kind of tangible examples of what we're, what we're talking about when we talk about Step Code. And um, we know that um, a number of communities are thinking about this, a number of First Nations are thinking about this, uh, even though it's, it, it's a code that was originally developed uh, for local governments. Um, it's got some good tools uh, for folks to think about that are uh, involved in the housing sector and on reserve housing. Um, so this webinar is part of our First Nations Home Energy Save program. We're working with uh, First Nations communities and support organizations to try and help reduce energy use in homes uh, on reserve and other buildings. Um, we're doing that through webinars like today, as well as in-person training events, um, and uh, also provide some uh, success stories and um, other information on our website. Um, and we've, thanks to the support of a number of different organizations that are li listed there, we're able to, to do this work. Um, there's a, uh, the link there to our website. Uh, you can subscribe to uh, the email list to get information about upcoming events. And um, there are recordings of the, some of the past uh, webinars as well there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, through this webinar, we're going to be um, uh, keeping the audio muted. We do encourage questions, and we'll be using polls as well to, to get input from you over the course of the uh, presentation. Um, and any technical difficulties, there's an email there you can uh, contact if you've got uh, any questions or difficulties. Just wanted to flag an upcoming event for those that are in the um, Prince George area or surrounding area, um, uh, co-hosted by Lily Tanay on April the 12th. Um, we've got uh, an air tightness uh, workshop, so that's sort of one component of what is going to be talked about today. But there's a full day training session that's available there uh, for up to 12 folks who are interested in, in a more of a hands-on um, training opportunity. And so if you're interested, um, I'll uh, later on in the webinar, I'll make sure to include the link in, to the registration page um, in your control panel. Uh, or just feel free to email me um, and I'd be happy to share information on that. Um, and we do expect to have at least one more uh, there was a previous event in, uh, in Port Hardy uh, earlier this month, and so we're looking to try and uh, to help support uh, where there's interest in um, a sufficient number of people to participate in the training. There's also um, several public workshops um, that are um, also available, and I can provide a discount code for uh, First Nations representatives that might be interested in some of those um, opportunities that are coming up. So without uh, further ado, um, uh, we have two uh, great speakers who are going to not only give a presentation, but also give us a, a bit of a orientation to the uh, Zero Energy Building Lab at BCIT. So Alex Hebert and Sean Saint-Amour um, are speakers today. Um, uh, sh they're uh, going to be telling us a bit about some of the um, different components that uh, folks should be thinking about in terms of step code, what it means, and um, we'll also uh, uh, give, as I said earlier, uh, provide some information on what's available at the lab. Um, so I'm just going to pass things over to them at this stage. Uh, just bear with me for a moment. Okay. okay, hello everyone. I'm going to see if I can set up the system so you can view both the uh, webcam view and the PowerPoint. So maybe Jim, just before we get going, can you let me know? Can you see our, our screen, our PowerPoint? And am yeah, I this, uh, this, the screen looks great. Uh, sorry, we, yeah, we can see your PowerPoint. There's no uh, video if you're planning to use that at the okay. moment. So we don't need to share the webcam really, but now you might be seeing us. Yeah, 
There you go. So uh, the webcam is not too useful at this point, but uh, maybe just so that uh, Sean and I get a chance to introduce ourselves. Uh, and then the webcam will be useful uh, because we will actually take everyone on a tour. Um, so maybe uh, everyone, if you can uh, uh, be patient, will uh, do a bit of a PowerPoint uh, presentation and then we'll uh, pause and, and get you to see some real wall assemblies and some real examples of uh, construction details that get you to different level of uh, performance. So yeah, in a nutshell, uh, my name is Alex. Uh, I work at BCIT. I'm in charge of a learning center called the Zero Energy Building uh, Learning Center. Uh, and this is Sean St. Amour. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Sean. I'm the uh, product consultant with 475 High Performance Building Supply. I'm also an uh, instructor here in the lab teaching the Passive House Tradesperson course. I also organize monthly Passive House socials, um, as well as I'm the uh, co-chair of the Home Village Association of Vancouver's technical committee. So if you're in ever in the Lower Mainland, let me know if you want to attend one of those events so you can continue on with the, uh, the education and all the fun that we have down here in Vancouver. Okay, so without uh, further ado, we're going to stop uh, uh, talking about ourselves and start presenting on, on today's topic. Um, before we get going, I uh, always like starting my presentation showing you a short video, so I'm just going to switch my screen here. Uh, and get you to uh, watch the first minute or so of the video and, and, and I'll be back in a second telling you why I think this video is important here. And maybe just switch off the video of uh, the camera so people can get a good view of it, uh, uh, Alex. So if you uh, if you saw on the screen uh, there was a, a number 74 centimeter is the uh, circumference of one leg of the cyclist. So this guy is a, uh, a German national champion track cycling. Uh, one leg 74 centimeter that would be 29 inch. So if you look at the, your uh, waist uh, uh, your belt, I'm a 34. Uh, that's my waist. He's a 29 for one leg. And so he's getting on the uh, bicycle here. Uh, and he got asked by maybe one of his kids uh, that just woke up, uh, Dad, can I have a toast uh, for breakfast, please? Uh, and he has to get the uh, electricity generated from his bicycle uh, to get a 700 watt toaster uh, running. And so if he was uh, on a track right now, he would be doing about 50 kilometers an hour um, uh, while producing 700 watts and, and, and the heartbeat is at 174 uh, and he has to maintain that 700 watt of electricity power production for long enough to get the uh, bread uh, to be toasted. He's almost there. As you can see, he's still around 700 watts. Uh, and finally, the toast <laughs> is uh, ready. So let me just switch uh, screen again. Uh, make sure I get you back on my uh, PowerPoint here. Um, And Jim, if I can just ask you to confirm that I'm back on the PowerPoint view and that you can still hear me okay? Uh, we can hear you, but there's still the video on the screen. Okay, and the video on the screen, I guess, is a screenshot, I think, hopefully. Uh, oh, yeah. You see, you see yeah, basic perfect. Okay. Yeah. So basically, uh, most of us have uh, electric baseboard heaters in our house. And uh, the one I have on the screen here is a four-foot uh, baseboard heater, which typically would be about a thousand watts. Um, I live in an apartment in Vancouver that is about a thousand square uh, feet, uh, and I have nine uh, 1,000 watts 
baseboard heaters that are not running all together, but they are all needed from time to time to keep my apartment uh, warm. And, and as you can imagine, uh, my apartment hasn't been uh, built uh, with uh, energy in mind. It doesn't have uh, very thick walls. It doesn't have good windows. Uh, the assemblies are not airtight and so on. So, so I have a lot of heat losses through the walls um, and, and therefore I need more baseboard heaters. And I kind of like uh, the analogy of the German cyclists uh, because it gives you an order of magnitude of how much energy is needed to power a home. So if you add a friend who is a world champion, uh, he could maybe power, you know, two thirds of a baseboard heater for you for a few minutes. Uh, and that's it. Um, of course, if he's biking from the inside of the home, he's also giving off some heat, uh, uh, which which skews the data a little bit. But to uh, think of an analogy, I'm getting the cyclist and the shed at the back as my power plant, and 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 I really cannot get much out of these guys. Uh, if you were to uh, have a house uh, that was built uh, like uh, uh, my my house. Um, you know, um, uh, you would uh, have to have a lot of friends who are cyclists. So I'll come back to the numbers on the screen here later. They're going to make more sense when, when we move to the next slide. So anyway, I'm just trying to get you interested in the topic. The topic is, hey, if we're going to build a house, might as well have good walls, make those walls well insulated, make them airtight, so that whatever energy we pay for, uh, precious energy, we keep it inside and we don't waste uh, any of it. So the agenda is divided between an intro to the step code and an intro to building science that um, is required uh, to get to the step code. Uh, I'll do the first part, I'll do the intro to the step code and Sean will uh, then go and, and tell you a bit about the building science uh, of it and, and give you a tour of the lab. Uh, uh, housekeeping, I guess we don't need to do that because you're at home, you you know where your emergency exits are and, and where the washrooms are, hopefully. Um, but uh, just so you uh, keep in mind, we're going to move to the instructor cam. Of course, if Sean is actually not wearing a helmet like this, it's a very simple webcam we're using, but you'll have to give me some feedback if I move too quickly or if, uh, if, if the image is not clear enough. Uh, we're not equipped with the the high, highest, uh, highest end of uh, digital uh, audiovisual equipment. So you'll have to, uh, to, to let us know if we are having any problems. Um, so next slide. Um, before I get going, just uh, a quick acknowledgement. Uh, the slides for the next five slides are actually an extract from a presentation that was prepared by BC Housing. Uh, so thank you, BC Housing, for allowing us to use these slides, um, and um, and uh, and uh, yeah, here we go. So uh, the energy step code, uh, maybe um, Jim, if you have a chance to do a poll, I'll be I would be curious to know how many in the room uh, have heard of it. Um, it's a fairly new uh, policy in the province. Uh, I usually only have a percentage of the class that has uh, heard about it and then uh, when I ask whoever heard about it to come at the front and explain what it is, it's usually nobody. Um, so um, so um, I'm not sure, Jim, should I wait to see what the poll results are uh, from, uh, from who knows about the step code? Um, sure. I, I, it's a slightly different question. It's just uh, the question is, um, uh, are you considering adopting the step code in your community? Yeah. Okay. Or? Yeah, that's that's definitely good enough. That would also mean that you know <clears throat> about it. So that's great. So and and am I seeing the results? If I click on the, uh, 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 I'll just I might have to read the results out here. So I'm just going to let people just got. I think everybody. Uh, so let's uh, share the results here. You might not be able to see it, but it looks like about 30% of people are saying yes. Um, 10% are saying maybe they're considering parts of it. 20% yeah. are saying not at this time, and 40% don't know. Okay, okay. So that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, good to know. So I'll I'll do my intro. I'll keep it high level because obviously uh, uh, a good a good number here uh, knows knows about it. I'll still do the whole uh, intro so that those who are maybe newer to it also get get the language up for when Sean does his presentation. It's actually a pretty simple piece of uh, a policy. It became uh, um, reality in December 2017, so we're really talking about uh, about a year ago, uh, a year and, a, and two months, I guess. 
but what happened in December 2017 is is mostly a, a reset of the uh, building code in the province, uh, giving a signal to municipalities that they would have to come up uh, with a vote to ado adopt the step code. So 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 yeah, uh, the step code became reality a year ago, uh, but uh, from an implementation point of view, it's really on a case by case basis, uh, depending on the municipality you're in and depending on on their timeline and and of course eventually the result of uh, of the vote. Um, but in the end, we know that uh, by 2032, uh, every municipality in BC will have to have adopted the step code. And not only will they have to have, to have ad adopted it, they will have to be building at the highest step of the step code. And so they call it a step code because they'll te they're telling the industry um, uh, about an end goal, which is a net zero ready uh, building. Uh, and they're saying, uh, don't worry, we're not asking you to switch to net zero energy ready overnight. We're giving you about 15 years and we're giving you a very progressive stepped approach so that you can learn how to do it, get better at it, uh, and, then, and then eventually do it. So we don't know uh, for sure uh, the timeline for moving from step to step, but we know that every municipality will be at the highest step by 2032. And so what, what is the uh, meaning of the highest step? Um, it's a uh, energy uh, performance uh, that uh, is based on a building that is extremely energy efficient, so energy efficient that you uh, would have enough roof space or enough space on the property to produce on your own, on site, the energy you need to operate. And so if you look at the numbers um, in the billing industry, uh, about 60% of the heat of the energy consumed in a house is from heating and cooling. Um, a net zero ready building, the building everybody will have to build by 2032, would barely need any heating and cooling. So that if you were to produce your own energy, your own electricity on site, it would only be for the lighting, for the computers, for the fridge. And, and other small appliances. So, so the only way you can get to a point where you're net zero ready uh, is, is if you have a building that is extremely well insulated, uh, built with air tightness in mind, so that the number of baseboard heaters that you need uh, in winter is very small. Um, I guess uh, I will be talking a lot for the next few minutes. Jim, if you see any questions on the screen or if uh, you know I stop making sense, uh, just wave at me or just interrupt. I'll be happy to uh, uh, to uh, repeat or correct. But um, I guess all I need you to understand now is that we're trying to get somewhere by 2032, and that somewhere is is a world where we build buildings with thicker walls, more insulation, better windows, uh, and so on. Uh, the step code uh, has multiple steps. Uh, step one is uh, today's standard. It's actually uh, status quo with the existing building code. Uh, in a residential a single family market, the highest step, the net zero ready step, the one that we need to reach by 2032, is step number five. So we have five incremental uh, uh, steps we have to take between now and 2032. If you're building a multifamily uh, uh, buildings, larger buildings, and, and you are considered a part three building per the, uh, st the uh, building code definition, uh, there are actually only four steps. So step one is status quo, step one is today, and, and, and the highest step, the net zero ready step by 2032 for larger multifamily is step four. And then finally, if you're in the construction of commercial buildings, office space, retail, uh, manufacturing and so on, uh, there are only three steps, and the highest step is um, step three. Um, I'll, 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 um, I'll go uh, through those um, uh, points and metrics one by one so that you guys get a chance to, uh, to assimilate and maybe make a few notes. So I already said uh, to you guys, most of the energy in the house comes from the heating and cooling system. Uh, we uh, we uh, used to have very simple buildings. I like this cartoon very much because it represents a building uh, where my office is. So I, I actually work in a house, and the house is the house you see in the middle here. Um, it's a house that has some pretty bad walls, pretty bad windows, pretty bad assemblies, and we try to make, make a net zero energy ready. 
uh, by adding a lot of gizmos and widgets and all sorts of things. So we have a fuel cell, we have a wind turbine, we have a geo exchange system, we have nine modes of operation, we have 17 pumps, we have three fans, two hydraulic RV system, LED system, timers, remote controls, DDC, so on. And we got to a point where the house is impossible to operate, impossible to manage, uh, very difficult to maintain, uh, and it doesn't uh, uh, get e even close to being uh, net zero ready. So what we're trying to do is move away from uh, that uh, fancy high-tech uh, approach and go back to a simpler building that is investing way more on the envelope, way more on the walls, way more on the windows, way more on the roof, uh, and then putting some very simple mechanical systems inside uh, uh, as a way to uh, get the comfort that uh, that that you need. Um, so um, yeah, I'm trying to understand the, uh, the the software. I see some 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 flashing happening. So I thought maybe I had a question. No, I think we're good. So um, I'm moving to the next slide here. Uh, I told everyone that the energy step code is a way to get to net zero. Uh, what does it mean for you as as a builder? What does it mean for you as an architect? What what does it mean for you as a uh, uh, an engineer uh, or anyone involved with the design and the construction of the, of a building? Well, it means only three things, and it's actually quite simple. Uh, it means that you have to design and build a building um, with uh, uh, while having three uh, metrics in mind. So the step code is interesting because it's moving away from a um, uh, prescriptive approach to building, which is what we're used to from the old building code, uh, a prescriptive uh, approach being uh, a way to build a building by looking at a list of things that are pre-approved and selecting from the list. So you could say, okay, I'm going to make my wall R16, and I'm going to make my uh, Windows U1.4, and that I know is going to be approved. Well, the step code is saying, wait a second, what if industry had some good ideas, and what if we were going to get better results by allowing them to do whatever they want and not giving them a shopping list to work with that is quite uh, uh, prescriptive and, and, and restraining ideas? And, and what if we were to say to everyone, do whatever you want, uh, as long as you can prove that your building will meet a certain level of performance for air tightness, that your building will meet a certain level of performance for envelope uh, qualities, and, and that your building will meet a certain level of performance for uh, the systems you're going to put inside. And so if we look at those one by one, uh, you can see uh, that um, we are working on, if you look at the bottom left of the screen, um, we're looking at uh, better walls, uh, better roofs. Uh, if you look at the image at the upper right corner, uh, it's a little red door within the door frame. That's an equipment referred to in industry as a blower door test. Uh, kit and it's usually uh, red <laughs> and it's basically uh, a fake door that you put in a doorway uh, that comes with a fan and you uh, pressurize or depressurize your building so you you push air in the building with the fan and you try to find leaks so 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 metric number one is about more insulation that's the bottom left uh, metric number two is about air tightness that's the upper corner and then in the middle uh, the step code is saying hey I'm happy you have a great uh, envelope uh, but make sure that your domestic hot water tank, uh, your uh, heating system, and any ventilation system in the house is also quite efficient. Um, so if we go and look at those one by one, um, the uh, envelope uh, metric in the step code world is referred to as the Teddy. So if you want to know how cool you are uh, and, 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 and how geek uh, you are when you're uh, in the industry, if you can uh, squeeze in, in a conversation somewhere, uh, maybe at the bar or at, at home, Teddy, you're, uh, you know you're in the know. So Teddy stands for Thermal Energy Den Demand Intensity, and it's a very simple measurement of how much energy is required uh, through the baseboard heaters to keep the house warm uh, in the winter. The second metric is air tightness. Again, as I said to you, you put a fan in the doorway and you, you try to blow, blow, blow up the building, you try to pressurize the building, and the measurement in the industry is refer referred to as not a Teddy, but an ACH, uh, which uh, stands for air change per hour. So how many times per hour will I replace the entire volume of air of the house by uh, the fan pressure that I have during the test? Uh, 
uh, or in other words, how big are the holes in my assembly? And the last metric is a metric that measures how performing, uh, how good uh, the systems are inside. It's a metric that mostly looks at the, the domestic hot water tank, uh, the heating system you have, whether it's a furnace, a boiler, uh, you know, a, a, a heat pump or a baseboard heater. And if you have fans moving air, is the efficiency uh, of those fans. And if, uh, again, you're the cool uh, you know, kid on the block here, uh, if you're building a house, you will refer to that performance metric as a MUI. Uh, if you're building a large multifamily or, 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 or a commercial building, you will refer to that metric as a TUI. And, and as you can see, the only difference between the two is the first letter. Uh, in a house, they only care about the three systems. You see them, it's an M for mechanical, so it only looks at mechanical systems. In a larger building, it also looks at the lighting system and the plug loads, uh, which means that uh, we can call it mechanical, we have to call it total. So the mu is, is mechanical energy use intensity, and the two is total energy use intensity. They're pretty much the same, except that one also looks at lighting um, and, uh, and plug load. So if uh, um, I was to meet you in the street, you know, in the next few days, and, and, and you were to say hi, um, I would ask you one question, and if you remember that one, uh, I feel I've done something good today. So just, 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 just please uh, focus on this one. Um, the energy step code is giving you three metrics to work with, and as long as you can prove that the house you've designed and the house that you've built is meeting those three metrics, an envelope metrics, an air tightness metric, and a systems metrics, then you're good um, to go. Teddy, ACH and MUI or Chewy. Uh, I have two more slides to go before I give the mic uh, to Sean here. Um, I want to insert a bit of a note here for those who have worked with buildings in the past and have worked with the inspectors and the different agents and the uh, different municipalities where you are. Uh, you have to understand that uh, the building code in the province is staying as is. Uh, the building code has uh, different sections in it. Uh, the building code talks about safety, it talks about health, accessibility, uh, fire, uh, structural int integrity, uh, and, and it also has a small section, section five on the screen in front of you right now, that talks about energy. And the energy step code, which is what today's presentation is about, is really only making a bit of an addendum to section five of the building code. So. Uh, everything you have to do or you used to have to do around fire and accessibility and electrical and, and structural and so on, you still have to do that. The step code does not make any changes to that, but it now says, hey, from an energy point of view, you guys have to design and build with these three metrics in mind. Um, so I'm going to do a bit of a repeat here, but how many steps? We all know now that by 2032, everybody needs to be at the highest steps. We know that different municipalities will start at different steps, and we don't know exactly when they're going to start, uh, but we're all going to meet at the highest step. Five steps for houses, four steps for multifamily, bigger than a certain size, so when you're considered a part three building, and three steps if you're uh, uh, working on commercial buildings. Uh, that's kind of a different representation here of what I just said, so you see uh, the upper steps um, ends at five for the house, they end at four for uh, a six-story wood frame building here. Uh, it also ends at four for a larger concrete residential building and the office building on the far uh, right, uh, the highest step is actually step three. Um, so, oh, I said, I said three slides, I actually have more slides. So the last uh, piece that I need to share with you is uh, you know, now that you understand we have three metrics, you know, the TEDI, uh, the MUI, and the ACH, uh, what, what to do with it? Well, um, the code uh, says to you, hey, uh, this is what you have to do. Uh, if you're building to uh, a step uh, two, uh, for example, for a house, uh, you have to, and I'm going to go from left to uh, right on the screen there, you have to have a, a, a 3.0 air change per hour when you do your air tightness testing. So it's 3.0 or better. Um, if you uh, were to do an energy model of the house, uh, it would show you that your mechanical systems, so the MUI, uh, will use at step two no more than 90 kilowatt hour per square meter of building per year. Uh, and that same building would use no more than 60 kilowatt hour 
per square meter of billing per year for the heating part. So that's the Teddy. And as we move up the scale, you see that we get to a point where those numbers keep going down. And at the highest step, so in 2032, when we all meet again, uh, that same house will have to be built at 1.0 air change per hour, uh, 25 kilowatt hour per square meter per year for the MUI, and then uh, 15 uh, kilowatt hour per square meter per year for the Chewy. Um, I'm not going to go through these numbers here. Just know that they are in the slides, but uh, the numbers are slightly different if you're building a larger, a larger building, multifamily. Uh, and then if you're doing commercial, it's also um, quite, uh, uh, quite, uh, quite a, a big task. And I have these photos of my German cyclists on every slide here. Um, I can tell you that uh, if you build to um, um, uh, 15 kilowatt hour per square meter, uh, which is the Teddy for the highest step in every of the category, you're pretty much at 10 watt of baseboard a year per square meter. So if you live like I do in a, a 1,000 square foot apartment, uh, which is a 100 square meter apartment, uh, you will need uh, uh, you will need a thousand watt of baseboard heater to get the apartment going. So as I told you when we first met about 30 minutes ago, I have nine 1,000 watt baseboard heater in my apartment. If my apartment had been built to the highest step of the step code. I would only need one baseboard heater. So I would go from nine baseboard heaters to one baseboard heater. So I'm going to give the, the mic to Sean here. Uh, I told you if I meet you in the street uh, next next week, I want you to remember the three metrics, an envelope one, the Teddy, an air tightness one, the ACH, and a mechanical one, the MUI. Uh, but it would be nice if you could tell me that there are anywhere between three and five steps. Uh, that uh, no matter what type of building, the highest step is a net zero energy ready. Uh, everybody's going to meet uh, at that level in 2032. And that uh, I'll need uh, someone to do an energy model to see if my building actually meets those two and Teddy and, uh, and ACH. Okay, so uh, Sean has a little bit of PowerPoint to do. Uh, and then as soon as he's done with the PowerPoint, we uh, will go with the live uh, uh, helmet, the, the instructor cam, and get, give you a tour of the lab and, and show you some real uh, real wall assemblies that were built to the different levels of the energy step code. So I'll give it to you, Sean. Excellent. Thanks, Alex. I'm going to speak a, a little bit louder because you might hear some uh, construction work in the background. That's the students that are doing the carpentry class. So. If I'm yelling into the mic, uh, just let me know, but I want to make sure that uh, my voice comes out pretty clearly. So diving into the building science, um, again, when the, the whole approach about step code that Alex talked about is the envelope first, and uh, it does require a good understanding of the building science of what's happening in the walls once we make them thicker. So we're going to go over those details, and then we've got some mock-ups that will actually uh, show how it is applied. So what you remember from uh, today, from my part, is six principles of high performance, five rules of building science, five critical barriers and uh, building science rules, and of course, you've already learned the three energy step code uh, metrics. So again, we're just going to go through this before we dive into the tour. So building science rules. So the five rules is heat flow is from the warm side of the wall to the cold side. And so typically uh, in our kind of climate, again, it's uh, going to be from the inside to the outside for a good portion of the year. Um, and that's pretty much generic for uh, all the different um, zones in BC. <clears throat> Excuse me. Moisture flow is from the warm to the cold again, usually. Vapor flow is from more, uh, more to less. Air flow is from the higher pressure to lower pressure. And of course, we've got gravity, which is acting downwards. So we look at the six performances of high performance construction. We have lots of insulation, continuous air tightness, minimal, if not no thermal bridges. So again, we're limiting thermal bridges, high performance doors and windows, a super efficient heat recovery ventilation, which is uh, commonly known as an HRV. And of course, mining your machines. So again, your uh, all your systems, appliances, and equipment uh, ideally is um, um, you know energy performing to uh, Energy Star. Um, so let's look at John, those. John, yeah. John, can I just ask a, somebody asked a clarifying question here? Sure. What's a thermal bridge? Ah, 
So it is a material in the wall where heat flow can be uh, can go uh, through it. And so if we look at a stud, for example, the stud is surrounded by insulation, but um, heat could go or sorry, could be uh, being removed from your interior space through the wood stud. But if we cover the walls, like we talk about putting a sweater on a house, that exterior insulation is stopping the heat flow through the stud. So that's uh, another example. You can have it through metal, again, which is a really good conductor of heat. Um, window frames typically are not super insulated. So there are a weak point in your envelope. And so heat flow could uh, could go through those two units. So um, good question. And uh, when we get to the mock-ups, we'll uh, we'll break that down in more detail so you can have a visual of that uh, that question. Okay. Sounds good. And maybe maybe just one more clarifying question is uh, uh, what a heat recovery ventilator is. And somebody asked, is that the same as a furnace? Um, so yeah, typic. Uh, sorry, a little bit of a complicated question because you could put. Um, your HRV connected to the furnace, but typically when we're getting to high performance, it's a separate piece of equipment that is in a sense, the lungs of your house. It is bringing in fresh air and expelling out um, stale or moist interior air. But what's nice is that the interior air that's already heated, it will exchange in the unit um, heat in coils so that as the air is flowing outwards, the incoming air will receive that uh, heat um, and be able to uh, come in and uh, and uh, and maybe have a slight like one or two degree temperature, but with the interior space, it'll warm up quite quickly. So um, we do have an HRV in the lab that uh, we'll show you. That's one of the more high performing ones used for uh, passive house um, projects. So we'll show you that unit to again clarify. Great. Thanks, John. Okay, so we look at the, the principles. So continuous insulation, um, you know, where again, the, the easiest way just to describe this, as I just said, is putting a sweater on a house. You know, it's one of those things when you were a, a kid and you said to your parents, you know, that you're cold and uh, instead of turning up the heat, they're like, hey, put on, you know, a sweater, put on some slippers. So now we're taking that same concept and applying it to our houses. And in doing so, we're gonna make them more airtight by having a continuous air seal layer around the uh, the envelope. So you can see that as number two. Um, you know, in the passive house, we deal with uh, an air exchange of 0.6, but uh, step code five would require a 1.0 um, ACH at 50 pascals. Now, we just spoke about limiting thermal bridges. You can see the, uh, the uh, kind of rainbow in the corner there. Those are the isotopes looking at the um, you know the heat in the in the in the envelope and ideally again you don't want to have points where condensation can occur um, because as we're building you know these thicker walls we want to make sure that they're more durable and um, will maintain uh, for a lot longer than our current housing stock is. So again, if you look at uh, multi-family projects, especially in Vancouver, you've got all these lovely. Uh, balconies that are uh, coming out and you can see the red there that's the heat um, being lost through those slabs that are uh, extending out from the floor and uh, being used in canopies so the balconies um, so again is having some type of devices to you know stop those uh, stop the heat loss so looking at high performance um, glazing systems so windows and doors that are high performing um, it's great that uh, in this past 10 years of the passive house world, we now have five local manufacturers of excellent windows and doors so that we don't have to import them in from Europe anymore. Um, and I think we might have another a sixth one uh, in another, another month. So it's pretty exciting that uh, we've got local manufacturing doing fiberglass, um, UPVC, wood, uh, aluminum clad. So there's a lot of options uh, locally for uh, excellent windows and doors. So the industry is ramping up with the uh, the improvements that um, the policymakers are asking home builders to uh, to approve on. So there's a lot of support in the industry as we move forward. Again, a little more dive into the uh, HRV ventilation. So it's clean, filtered, fresh air all year round. Uh, typically, 
you know, um, the units are able to change out an entire house in about three hours. Um, in a house maybe prior 1940, you know, it's actually changing air every six hours, but all those leaks are through the walls. And so you've got a lot of, you know, dirt and, uh, and particles that are being brought into the house. Um, and some of the more high performing houses built, you know, past uh, in the last say 30 years, um, you know, again, the, the air may not get removed properly for even up to 24 to 48 hours. So we're talking about, you know, indoor air quality that is excellent, uh, you know, clean, fresh air. Uh, and so we're not having concerns of mold and mildew and so forth. So um, the, uh, the HRV is again, like the lungs of the house. And as you make any improvements to your envelope, the, uh, the next main part is to ensure you've got an excellent heat recovery ventilation system in your process. Um, now, depending on your location, you can supplement the space with heating and cooling, um, especially when you look at multifamily projects, the bigger ones. The, you know, in, in, in just a note too is when we look at high performance projects, you know, even the heat given off by a human is factored into these calculations in, in the modeling. Um, and so when you get into more larger buildings, the uh, heating is not an issue because you've got so many people and in, in the units that cooling becomes an issue. So, um, but you can add these systems, um, you know, mini split units um, to, uh, to the systems it's, and that can be easily arranged. So the, uh, the next um, point I wanted to give you guys is another number. So it's going to be five critical barriers of your wall systems. So now we're looking at the water shedding surface, which is typically your exterior cladding, the water resistant barrier, which is, uh, you know, in, in our climate is the inward area of, uh, of the rain screen, um, air barrier. And uh, again, a question out to everyone, how many air barriers are you allowed to have in a building? For those that, uh, that do know, again, you can have multiple air barriers, but you do want them to be continuous. Vapor retarder, or I'll say the vapor control layer, is typically on the warm side of the wall, and um, you're only gonna have one vapor control layer. Some of you might know it as a vapor barrier. I'm also gonna throw out the word vapor retarder, because again, it's reducing the, uh, the vapor flow. Um, so I'm just going to call it the, the vapor control layer, okay? And then the, uh, the big yellow, or sorry, the yellow uh, section there is insulation. And so now we're looking at insulation in the bats. And we're also looking at the option of having them on the outside and have exterior insulation. So if we look at a sample, or sorry, an example of the windowsill, you can see again the insulation in the stud cavity insulation, uh, a thin, like a, a one inch board on the outside. You can see the, so now you can sorry, look at the, the color coding here. So you can see the outside on the right is the water shedding surface, which of course is, you know, the outside of the window frame out of the, the metal flashing down the window trim and then down the exterior cladding. The red is the water resistant barrier. So again, that's still the plane of the glass, but in the, uh, the window, they typically have some venting. And so if there's water that happens to get through the, uh, the window frame, it's able to um, get out. And then it, uh, the rod and caulk is stopping water or any moisture from getting into the interior house. And that ties into uh, a windowsill tape. Then it ties into um, uh, a material on the outside of your plywood layer and running all the way down. The air barrier is, oh, do we have a question? Yeah, just a question uh, while you have this picture up is um, someone's asking is what sort of product are you using for the water resistive barrier usually? Yeah, so I mean most people probably see uh, Tyvek as the kind of dominant product on the marketplace. Um, we've got uh, some examples here of high performance products from Sega as well as Proclima. Um, and uh, there's other options too. 
yeah, and I can show you some examples of those uh, those materials that we have in the lab today. So, um, so yeah, Tyvek is typically the you know the product of choice. Um, what we do like to see is the green line there again is the air barrier. So when it comes to uh, the WR being on the outside as well being the air barrier, is the taping process is more uh, detailed. And this is where we'll talk about is before you start construction is you having a plan because that green line needs to be continuous all the way around your building. And so we actually call it a, a red line test. In this case, it'd be a green line test, but where you would take your pen and go all the way around your 2D um, uh, of your house um, in your plans to ensure that that air barrier is continuous. Okay. Uh, in this case, the uh, vapor retarder um, is the blue line, and it's commonly people would see that as the poly. Now we're looking at high performance products, sometimes smart vapor control errors um, that are replacing the poly. Uh, so poly is a vapor barrier because it's a class one. The vapor retarders end up being a class two or a class three, um, like even to the point where like plywood or OSB could be your vapor control layer. Uh, and again, this is where um, the model that you're working with with your energy advisors will help detail and, and work through your, um, you know, your wall assemblies and your roof assemblies to ensure that the, uh, the building science is, is properly um, installed. Because uh, you know, in, in, in construction, there is multiple ways of doing it. We actually look at it like, there's 1.4 million choices you start off with when you set forth on building a house and you end up with about 80 you know, different products. So it's a funnel that uh, gets narrow pretty quick once you decide on how you want to make up your wall assemblies and roof assemblies and then until your you know, interior finishes. So lastly here again, I kind of talked about the window frame um, is insulated. The glass of your windows is insulated. Um, we're now looking at triple pane windows in high performance. So again, there's even more opportunity for, for better insulation in the, the window, which is typically the weakest point in your envelope. And uh, again, we've got a lot of insulation within the studs, which is quite common. So again, we've uh, now discussed six, five, five, and you've already talked about uh, three. And so all of those uh, envelopes and rules apply to the matrix of air tightness, equipment, and systems, and envelope. And so now we're going to uh, switch, and we're going to look at some mock-ups and properly detail the, um, sorry, properly detail the, you know, the, the critical barriers, so you can see from not just the, you know, the sketch to uh, to the drawings. So we're just going to transition here, real quick, to the uh, to the mock-ups, and. Uh, I'll show you in one second. So just take a breather, have a sip of water or coffee, and we will switch the lab. Oh, you need that one. Yeah, we'll reconnect. Okay. Okay. And then here for me. Try to try to use the computer. Leave the computer here. You can even give me power if you want. Maybe while they're um, sorting out the technology, I'll just, um, I know there's a couple of other questions that we'll get to as we're looking at the modules. I'll just launch a poll about um, whether anyone who's involved in the webinar today might be interested in attending an in-person training workshop in your area, um, covering some of this, but perhaps in a lot more detail. Okay, so Jim, I think I'm, uh, I'm connected now. I was thinking okay. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, just, or maybe uh, I'm not, am I? Am I 
I'm just doing a I'll poll right now. So I'm just doing a poll, okay. Alex. So just uh, I'll just share okay, the well, results, and then we can. And an extra, and then, an extra two minute is good for us. So, so I'll yeah. let you finish the poll. Yeah. Carry on. But if you stop sharing your screen, then that'll give you a bigger win, a bigger picture for people to look at a video. Uh, so it looks like about half or a little more than half of people are interested uh, for sure in uh, in-person training and a few people maybe and and about a third uh, not at this time. So that's that's great. Thanks very much. That's useful info for us for future planning. Okay, so I believe I'm not sharing my screen anymore. Uh, we can still see it. So, okay. If you press, if you go under sharing and and press stop showing screen, there's a big stop button. Yep, there we are. Okay, okay yep. good. So uh, you'll see it Sean in a second. I'm just gonna add. I, I made a note here. I guess I forgot to mention uh, before Sean uh, uh, got to do his presentation. Uh, a lot of people are talking about passive house as a as a. Uh, uh, reference standard in the industry um, and, and for good reasons because it's an excellent standard it's very easy to follow uh, the link between step code or energy step code and passive house is quite simple uh, the energy step code does not refer to standards so if you want to build to energy star or if you want to build to r2000 uh, or even passive house or lead uh, you can still do that not a problem uh, the step code is just saying as long as you focus on these three metrics um, but uh, what's interesting is if you were to look at the three metrics that Passive House mostly focus, focuses on, uh, they're pretty much the same as the ones uh, I showed you for the step code. And if you look at the highest step of the step code, uh, you're pretty much building a Passive House with some nuance and, 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 and some uh, small differences in number. But um, for me, when I, I talk to people, I say, think of the highest step of the step code as being very close to being a Passive House. So so if you hear Sean say the, the, the word Passive House, think a, the, no, 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 know that Passive House is a standard, it's a good standard. Uh, the step code doesn't force you to build to Passive House, but if you were to build to Passive House, you would automatically get to the highest step uh, of the step code. Okay, so let's give that a try now. So, Sean, um, you're on camera. I'll try to keep you centered. Okay. Uh, ready when you are. Fantastic. So, again, we talked about the uh, six principles of the step code. Now we, uh, sorry, then we also talked about the critical barriers. And so now I want to look at a live mock-up of what those barriers entail. So this mock-up is actually in the builder's guide. So if you went to the BC Step Code website and you looked at the builder's manual, you'd be able to see the details of how this wall was constructed and you can actually build it yourself. It's a really good tool to uh, to show any of your clients or people that are interested of, of how to deal with the step code and the different layers. So we're going to start off on the outside, again looking at the water uh, a shedding surface so again flashings cladding another flashing you know trim now the interesting is in this part we've got exterior insulation and so the window is further inside not significantly but it is you know it is different of how it is set in inwards and so the the trim and the and the sill flashing is is a lot larger than typical then we have then it transitions to another trim, and then of course comes back to more more cladding. So any of that water, and I just want to point out just to, I get another numbers about the four Ds, which is looking at water control. So we're looking at deflection from materials to keep water away from our walls. We're looking at a durable wall where the the layers, the vapor control layer, air tightness is allowing the wall to dry out, and we've got materials that will allow for long term. Uh, durability and then potentially looking at building 100 plus houses it can be done i know some of you might be you know thinking that's impossible but it actually is, is quite easy when we do and build things at a higher level um, we've got the rain screen so we've got some drying in our walls to ensure that uh, again water isn't getting past it and uh, of course you know throughout the whole system there's allowance for drainage. Drainage on the outside of the wall and potentially in the rain screen. So if water does get in, you know, it will find its way out and not work its way into the house that we've seen previously with the leaky condo um, issue. So uh, high performance walls are definitely in place. So now I've talked about the, 
WSS. We a little bit talked about the uh, the WRB. So you can see here again as the product that was a, uh, a choice was Tyvek. Um, you can see that it's taped, and again that taping is for um, also as the exterior air barrier. So when we built it, we had a plan. We decided where the air barrier was going to be in placed. One thing about the air barrier is it's not something that you can go to Home Depot or Home Hardware and buy. You actually have to think about it because it's multiple components. You know, you go to the the, uh, the gentleman at the store and say, hey, I'm here to buy an air barrier. He's going to be like, I'm sorry, I can't help you. You have to look at the materials to tie it all into. So if you look at it, the WRB is connected to the window with rod and caulk. Um, and so that air barrier is also connected with, with that as well. You've got a window here that uh, um, is high performing. It's a triple pane window. You could have in other units, you can see it's filled with more insulation. It comes down, we've got a venting hole here on the window. So if water got in past the, uh, um, in the joint that it can find its way out. Again, rod and caulked, taped to the, the sill. And uh, you know, there's some details that, are, that I call belts and suspenders where it's not necessary, but it doesn't take much effort just to ensure that the system or the, the, the wall is even acting in, and being more performance. So here you've got a window tape that's connecting the air barrier system to the WRB. But we've even added another strip just to go over the insulation so that if there was water that got into the system, that it wouldn't get the, um, the insulation wet because it actually can uh, lower the thermal resistance of or the R value of, the, uh, of your insulation. So again, a detail there, um, you know, sing, simple things that are applied, bug screens, you know, in place where they should be. Um, the flashing is tied into the window, so it's connected and it's also held in place by the, uh, the, the window trim. Um, so that's pretty much it for this mock-up. Again, you can uh, go to the uh, Stepco website and look at the builder's manual and be able to download that book and be able to construct this wall for, for yourself. Hey, so now Sean, I'm gonna go to- Sean, before you move, uh, there's just a couple related questions I think that might be good to address right here. Great. If you could. Um, so there's a couple of questions that came up around that external air barrier. I think it's a new idea for people. Sure. Uh, like, for example, someone said, you know, isn't air, isn't it supposed to be on the inside of the wall? And, is, you know, is is moisture going to condense uh, that, that gets into the wall? That's basically kind of the gist of, of several different questions here. So I, I'm glad you brought that up because I did miss um, showing the vapor control layer. <clears throat> So in this application, um, the, um, the poly is acting as the uh, a vapor control, you know, in the sense of vapor control barrier. In this particular one, because uh, this one would be more of like a step code two or step code one wall where the air tightness metric is only about three, um, that's where, you know, they've got the one line. When you look at step code five, you are looking at having potentially more air barriers because the vapor control layer will typically be your air barrier as well as an exterior air barrier approach. So in this case, the, um, the poly, the vapor control layer is stopping a lot of the air getting through the wall. Um, but the problem is though it's not continuous. So you may get air um, moving up into the joints um, but the most time that exterior insulation is stopping um, any condensation happening in the structural part of your wall and what happens still outside. So that's where again the, the sweater really helps to ensure any condensation would happen outside of your air barrier and your vapor control air. So I'll just Hopefully that answers the uh, the question, and I think you had another one. Yeah, that I think that's the main the main one there. Um, man, whoever asked that question, hopefully that it, you can just uh, type in the question box again if it hasn't uh, quite answered it. If there's something about it, but I think it is. I think for folks, it's it a 
it's a bit of a new idea, I think, that there are multiple um, barriers to air movement through the wall. And and so, Alex, here I, I turned the camera to do a bit of a selfie here. Um, uh, it is where most of the confusion is when we do the teaching because uh, there's an understanding of, uh, most of the time, there's an understanding of what a vapor barrier is, and, and most people still use poly, and so people refer to it as poly, and we know that poly is on the inside of the wall, just, just before the drywall. Uh, then we talk about WRB, which is one of the other five uh, layers, and if I see a Tyvek, you know, or, or a Typar, uh, people kind of know what it is. It's really when we bring in the concept of air bearer that, that, that people are scratching their head a little bit. And that's because an air bearer can be anything as long as it's air impermeable and it's continuous, right? And so uh, to answer the question, uh, the air bearer can be exterior, it can be interior, it can be both. It can be interior uh, on the ceiling using your poly and it can be exterior on the wall using your uh, Tyvek. And, and you do a transition from the outside to the inside using the top plate of your wall, for example. So, so it gets really confusing for the simple reason that there's no right or wrong answer. Or I guess there is a wrong answer. The only wrong answer would be if it's not continuous, it's wrong, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it can be anywhere. Now, you still have to understand building science so that you don't have a moisture problem in your walls, uh, which is for sure, you know, probably one of the, one of the main thing you want to avoid. And, and that means you need a vapor control layer uh, that does, you know, what it's supposed to do. Uh, but as Sean was saying, if you have the right amount of external insulation, which is the extra sweater, you get to a point where the inside of your wall stays so warm all year that you never get below the dew point in, inside the cavity. And if you never go below the dew point inside the cavity, you never get vapor, water vapor turning into water. Uh, and, and that uh, mostly you know, prevents any mold or, or any, any rotten joints and so on. Okay, I'll give it back to Sean now. So before we go to the next mock-up, I just thought I'd just show you in the lab again, we've got all the different types of insulation that you could be using. You could be using the foams, mineral, um, recycled glass, which is, uh, you can even use recycled glass now for below grade. We've got wool, wood fiber that can come into different thickness, even have cork. So this whole line here kind of shows you, you know, either renewable, more sustainable products, as well as petroleum products, but uh, again, lots of different choices to to use for insulation. So again, we're going to go from the uh, the step code mock-up to more of a high performance wall system here. And so in this case, the vapor control layer is on the inside, but it's now also acting as the air barrier because you can see the continuity is now flowing from the plywood using a tape tie in the control layer. Um, there's a window tape to tie into the to the window, so it's continuous in here. You come up, it's tied back around the window, tied up and over the, uh, the top sill, and then actually goes over and then ties into the WRB, which ends up being a, an air barrier as well. So there's two air barriers. They're actually also continuous. This mock-up's nice because we even have a roof system. So you can see here, the um, vapor control layer, which is a, a material, actually transfers into a plywood. And so you can see that tape is connecting. And so above your truss, you can add lots of insulation and you can walk on it. And so it's a kind of a more durable system on your roof where, um, again, the, the vapor control layer is, is nice and tight in. You put a service cavity for putting in your lights. In this case, and uh, one thing to point out that I didn't talk about is there's multiple wall systems you can build. You can do like your standard you know, construction, which is just a stud cavity. We can talk about double studs, deep studs, as well as split insulation. Uh, my personal favorite, favorite is, is the split insulation because I just really like the whole sweater approach to a house. You just really ensured that the dew point is further out. You can get higher levels of insulation um, so when you want to get to, uh, again, step code five, you, you, it's just a, I personally think it's a simple approach. Just go through the details here because we've got uh, a bit of a concrete, you know, a slab mock-up. So you can see you would have, you know, exterior insulation outside your uh, slab or your foundation wall. As you can see, we tied in uh, a WRB over the foam to ensure that water 
did get in the system, it's working in. You can see it's all taped where it's shingled. So again, any water coming down really can't get inwards. The, uh, in this case, the uh, uh, WRB or air barrier is actually a peel and stick product. Can you turn your mark up a bit? Push the mark up so I see it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's Good. better. Okay. Um, so you can see the extra layer. So we've got um, two pieces here uh, of a two inch a mineral wool on the outside. Again, I really like the sill detail here because they, you can see now we're, we're adding insulation to the bottom side of the frame. And if any water did get into the system, it has a way of getting out and not getting into the insulation. Again, we've got cladding, we've got our bug screens, um, but you can see now how far back that window is in the system. And so you even have the, you know, the trim pieces, which are actually providing some shading as, you know, depending on where the window is in the wall, um, the, uh, the trim pieces are acting as a shading device for your free envelope. You can see here again, the uh, having at least 12, 16 inches of overhang. So again, water is probably only gonna hit down here in most cases because of the, the distance. Um, so again, we've got the four Ds in place. We've got a wall system that deals with drainage, drying, uh, and the materials and choice are going to be uh, quite durable. Um, so just to kind of continue with where the air barrier is, so we've got it tying up the wall on the outside. Again, the window um, is rotten and caulked. So this is an interesting detail because it is an exterior air barrier approach, but when it comes to the window, because that we um, were allowing for, for um, water to be able to get out the air barrier in the window actually transitions to the inside plane of the window but then at the rod and caulk it then comes back out so you could have so just to be clarified on that is the wrb is acting as the air barrier on the outside of your structure but when it gets to the window it actually transfers to the inside of the window works way up and then comes back up so if uh, there's a question or if you want me to clarify that, I can do that afterwards. Um, but uh, so just again, is the WRB is well in place. It's a peel and stick product. And then at the uh, part here, it transitions to uh, a membrane just because of what's happening in the uh, roof detail. We talk about reducing thermal bridges. So again, lots of insulation to stop the heat flow going through the studs, even up here. We've broken this connection with a screw to ensure that you've got that sweater is really continuous all the way around the house. Um, and there's proper ventilation in your, your trusses. So we look at, you know, this, this wall thickness um, is probably more for the lower mainland, but up north, in northern BC, we can add a lot more insulation. And we're talking about fasteners screwing in the uh, the rain screen back in and again all these fasteners hold up you know a 200 pound guy quite easy and so it's quite easy now to add you know more layers and create even a thicker sweater on your overall assembly so again you've got fasteners that are screwed into the wall it gives an example of you know the, what's available now in the marketplace can you tell us about the thickness of the, the plywood? Oh yeah, sorry. So uh, the RDH has done a great study recently where when you're using these fasteners, we're going to transition from half inch plywood to five eighths or three quarter inch because if you're screwing in and you don't hit a stud, as long as you're hitting the plywood, we now have some engineering that says that the the um, sorry the uh, the plywood will maintain the durability and the structure, the strength of that screw. So again, small change to construction, but allows for, you know, again, that thicker envelope. Um, just to go from part uh, nine, just quickly to commercial. Can we ask project. a question here, Sean? Sure. Sean, before you transition, can we ask a couple of questions on the sure. that other assembly? Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Um, so one was just kind of looking at how the foam is sealed at the base. You know, do you have any issues with pest control, or how do you how do you deal with the bottom of the outside foam there? Yeah. So in this case here, you know, we've got some hardy board um, going over top. 
um, you know, the drain drainage material can go over and tie it in. So there any there will not be any issues with pests getting into the system and uh, and you know making this any other home. It's um, again, you know, there's a lot of things going on, on the outside. Again, this is going to be uh, built into the ground, so you're going to have about eight inches. And typically, you know, people are covering that foam with either uh, marine grade plywood or hardy board to ensure that uh, one from aesthetics, people don't see the foam, um, but to deal with, to deal with that uh, pest issue. So yeah, that was the first question. Yeah, and there was another question. I'm not sure if this is related to this assembly or if I missed it from before, but someone asked, they felt like the window was installed um, incorrectly, which I'm be surprised. So is it, does it open towards the outside? Wow, yes. The so this particular window is, um, you know, it's using the European system. So it does go to the inside, and it is a European one where it does the tilt and turn. So this is the tilt and turn is really nice for ventilation in the summertime because you crack this window at night and you get night cooling that flushes out, uh, you know, the house. So you know, more of these high performance windows are looking at interior um, or opening into the interior and so some people might say hey there's issues with blinds but all that stuff can be easily figured out and discussed to ensure that uh, the blinds don't become an issue sure. and yeah. a lot of the Europeans are using exterior blinds it's not commonplace here in North America yet we do have a lot of companies selling exterior blinds um, but I don't think the market is quite ready for that approach yet. Can you tell us why exterior blinds? Oh yeah, sorry, with the exterior blinds versus interior blinds is the fact that the interior blinds would still be trapping heat in between the glass and the blinds. Like it's doing a good thing of stopping you know, light into the space, but what's nice about the exterior, when the blinds come down, they're blocking off that heat that would be coming inwards. So this is where we talk about different shading devices so trees good overhangs um you know window placements to ensure that uh, we can reduce some of the heat gain that happens with windows now obviously this is just a, a piece of an assembly of a wall but for for the type of materials and thickness of insulation what sort of step level would you be aiming for with that type of uh construction that you're showing us yeah this one again is more of a step uh, five wall because of the amount of thickness that we have. Um, with step, that, step, step five in Vancouver. Yes, yeah, sorry, five in Vancouver. Okay. And again, the uh, the yeah. model that you'd be creating to get your, you know, your Teddy and your Mui um, numbers would, you would be able to figure out how much insulation is required to achieve those metrics. <clears throat> and I guess, uh, Alex here, I'm gonna try to, uh, to do the selfie thing again. Uh, obviously, the colder the climate, the more insulation you'll need to hit the same teddy, right? So, so I'm going to turn it again and shoot the mock-up Sean was showing. You literally have two walls opposite to each other. They're both made out of a two by six with uh, some mineral wool bath insulation. Uh, one was uh, designed to hit a step five equivalent in Vancouver, and the other one was designed to hit a step five equivalent a little bit north of Prince George. And you'll see there's actually double the layers of exterior insulation, right? So you see the two, uh, two layers of insulation on one side, four layers on the other side, it's the same crew that built the house in Vancouver. Um, they built a house in uh, Prince George. Uh, they wanted to hit the uh, 2032 Nezio already, so they needed more um, insulation in a colder climate. So I'm just going to go again. We're starting to uh, get closer to our timeline here, so I'm just going to quickly talk about um, a multifamily or commercial project where you've got uh, a different assembly because it's going to be a metal clad. So the metal stud, we've even got even you know some higher performing steel studs in the system, filled with uh, bad insulation on the interior. It's a curtain wall window system, high performance. So again, you can see the how thick that glass piece is. Can you turn it from? Oh, sorry. So again, drywall uh, insulation, looking at a vapor barrier paint approach. 
And so you can see again, uh, getting uh, thicker levels of insulation because of the steel studs and the fact that the steel studs do allow for more uh, heat flow through them because the type of material. You can see the, uh, the, the metal uh, zeggers that are attached are on fiberglass uh, pieces. Um, so we've got fiberglass in these ones and we can even have metal with a fiberglass connection. And you can just see the massive insulation. This has got an aluminum clad panel process that's clicked in. And you can see here again the, you know, the, the many layers of the insulation. Um, if you're doing bigger projects, you can do a custom order too, where all this could actually be one material um, manufactured and sent to site. So you got a fiberglass clip, you have a metal clip that has the fiberglass right at the connection. And so you can see the different layers here. So, you know, one thing as we do move forward, you know, the thickness of walls are getting greater. Um, and that's again, is to stop the heat that is generated in here or even the cooling from transmitting through your wall. We accepted it before, but now we're uh, again, making the change to respect the heat of cooling that's being generated so that it stays in place. Um, just want to look at another assembly system where we're looking at again about different types of exterior insulation. Here we, uh, we talked about the mineral. This one here is looking at um, you know, a two by four or a two by six structural wall, you know, allowing for your electrical and your plumbing to be installed. Then we have the, uh, you know, either you could tape the plywood. We've proven at 475 that if you use um, a vapor control layer on the outside of the plywood, it was faster and cheaper to install. You could then get thicker layers of wood fiber. Um, another example, again, is, is the stuff that's being made um, in Germany, we hopefully will have production in North America in, in, in the near future. But again, you can have thick wood walls as well. And in Vancouver, we do have that rain screen being installed. So this is a different type of material, uh, European manufactured, but is now found locally here in Vancouver. Another approach, which seems to be, you know, from a cost perspective, um, uh, being you know more feasible. Um, but it ends up being even a thicker wall, but it is filled with cellulose. So the eye joists, which are, are reducing here, the thermal bridge of heat flow are containing the cellulose and you have an airtight barrier um, at the, the plywood, but also on the outside that's holding in the cellulose. So again, we've got lots of different examples. Um, you can talk about liquid applied barriers, foams taping it. Again, just be aware of the, uh, the five critical layers and the, uh, the building science. So I think at this point, um, I just want to uh, kind of recap my topics of the six principles. So again, we have, I want to make sure you, so if you want to say them along with me to make sure that they land in your, uh, your head and you remember, again, we've got lots of insulation, um, continuous air barrier, minimal thermal bridges, high performing windows and doors, an efficient HRV, and the last one is mining your machines to reduce the uh, electrical amount on those machines. Again, we talked about the five critical barriers, the rules, and so I leave you with six, five, four, three. And again, we should be doing this for today because we have one planet. So that's my uh, recap. Alex, I'll let you do yours and we take some questions. And so, uh, Jim, I know you and I had talked about uh, trying to end early enough to have questions. Uh, Maybe I'll give you the mic now. We have 10 minutes to go. Uh, I can also move uh, back to the PowerPoint if you want. I think I have one last slide that summarizes everything. So we can do it different ways. We can just leave it here and, 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 and uh, say thank you and, and goodbye. We can do questions. We can do one more slide as you prefer. Why don't we, we've got a few questions here that came up um, over the last little while, so why don't we try and tackle some of those and some, why don't you keep the camera on because I think it might be helpful to look at some of the assemblies for these, they seem to be a little bit more more detailed. So um, there are a couple related to the kind of the, the roof insulation and ensuring, like how do you ensure that there's sufficient ventilation? Um, so if you could maybe look at that, um, assembly with the truss the trusses and explain in a little more detail about how that is obviously this might require someone to go to the course i think to to fully uh, deal with this but 
Sure, like okay, we'll start with this one. So in this space, we've got air that's being coming up through the soffits, getting into the area. You can't, you can't see it, but there is up in this section here, there's about four inches of space above the insulation that allows for the airflow going this way. And typically there'd be cross ventilation as well uh, in this way to ensure that that upper area has a lot of chance to breathe and um, get any you know, moisture or any issues that would be you know, happening. In but you can just see the amount of insulation that is in the roof cavity compared to the wall. So we're sometimes we're talking about double the amount of insulation. And so you think about it, you know, what's giving off more heat on your body? It's your head and your feet. So we're talking about, you know, a good toque applied to your house. Right. And and the bolt that so you're I holding there, exactly. someone also someone also asked, is there any concern about um, thermal bridging with those? So like how much does that affect uh, yeah. the energy uh, flowing through the wall? So it, it does get calculated. Um, there are different types of screws, like stainless steel screws are, you know, more of the high performing ones. Of course, they cost more, so there is dependent on the budget. But all of the screws are calculated in your in your model as a thermal bridge. But again, we we have tried to reduce the amount. So in this case, we've got you know one here. So we got one here, one every about every foot. Um, I know in one high performing project, I think the uh, the energy um, modeler calculator, there's about 1,500 screws, but guess what? They all come with uh, a rating for uh, that can be calculated for your thermal bridge. And so you can calculate and model all of this kind of stuff now. It's Again, we're talking about performance-based um, you know, envelopes that, again, uh, are prescriptive and, and calculated out and modeled. So kind of the, the keys is, is as we move forward is you're modeling your buildings before you build and you're starting off with a, a really good plan. Uh, for those who know James Berger with RDH, he always talks about what is your plan? What is your plan? You know, what is your air barrier? How is it tying in? What is the vapor control layer in your assembly? And how is, uh, you know, vapor or, um, or moisture dealt with your entire assembly? So I can't, leave, can't stress those two keys uh, enough. Okay, great. Um, uh, hopefully we've gotten to most of the questions. We do have one last poll that I'd like to ask in terms of the types of support people would find helpful um, for when they're looking at the um, step code. So maybe I'll do that and then um, uh, Alex, if you got a final slide, then we can do that afterwards. Okay. So the question is, you know, we're, we've, we're talking today about kind of trades training and that certainly seems to be something that a number of people would find useful. Um, but um, we're interested in, um, no, I'm sorry, I've set this up in the wrong way. So you can only select one. You should have been able to select more than one. So if you're if you're interested in any of these, please um, feel free to let us know what you think. You can also use the question box if there are things that you would find useful when you're looking at um, adopting the step code. Um, so again, apologies about the poll. You should have been able to answer more than one, but I can't. I can't change it now um, at the last minute here. So if you've got if you've got more than one thing that you would find useful, um, <clears throat> uh, feel free to type that into the uh, the question box. We're just looking for any ideas that you've got on uh, on what you would find to be uh, most useful. <coughs> okay, so I think I'll just close this for now, and it looks like. Um, uh, we've got a number of different things, but uh, the top one being education awareness for leadership, staff, and community at 43%. Second is uh, uh, housing policy development, including energy efficiency at about 29%. And then um, a few people thought specifications and support for building design would be would also be useful. Um, but certainly if you've got other ideas after the webinar, uh, feel free to get in touch. So if Going I could comment, you, Alex. so yeah, just before Alex wraps up, I'll just comment on that poll just so people are aware of is um, again a lot of architects and designers have been taking a lot of classes on high performance and so the you know there's actually more almost I'd say four times the amount of architects and designers that are 
learn high performance versus the trades. So we're really working on improving the education of the trades right now to try to get them caught up. But at least from the designer standpoint, um, there are we're definitely ahead in that perspective. Um, uh, the builder guide again and the, and the information on the step code website is a fantastic resource. And of course, Alex and I are here all the time and, and can help you out. Um, in all the different areas, so please use this as a resource in the future. So, Jim, can you can you see our screen right now? Am I in sharing uh, sharing mode? Yes. Yeah, we can see your screen. Um, so, you know, I'm going to leave you. I want to skip to the last slide now. I want to leave you with the legs, just so that you uh, uh, keep in mind how precious the energy is, but also from a heating point of view, how difficult it is to heat a house and. And that once you're done doing all the work, might as well keep the heat inside. Um, our group, so Sean and I and uh, Vanessa and Mary, the two other uh, colleagues in our team, we, we lead a center at BCIT called the uh, Zero Energy Buildings uh, Learning Center. That's the uh, web address. If you uh, go in Google, you just have to type BCIT space ZEB, so Zero Energy Buildings, uh, and you'll find us. Uh, we have a suite of courses we offer in the lab here, and that's the Cadillac for sure because it's a big space. We have lots of mock-ups, lots of examples. Uh, but we have a version of the lab we call the lab in a box, uh, and we uh, literally compressed the lab and uh, got a way, found a way to fit it in three boxes that can travel. Uh, so we have a hands-on course that uh, we can deliver on the road. We're doing a partnership with the Community Energy Association right now, so we're going to be in uh, Revelstoke, Nelson, Pentington, Lake Country, and Campbell River. But if you, Jim, or anyone online is interested, we can, you know, we, we, we need a partner to organize these trips because we don't have access to the students. But if someone has enough student, our instructors will come to you and deliver a course. And so based on the poll, uh, I want to add one last thing. Uh, we built this space here with, with uh, trades uh, in mind, and to our surprise, about 40% of our audience are, are non-trades. We have building officials, we have had uh, policy makers, uh, realtors, uh, financial advisors. Like It's very interesting to see how there seemed to be an excitement for a hands-on experience. So uh, please keep that in mind if you're trying to convince your community leaders that this is a good thing. Uh, try to keep the PowerPoint down to a few slides and, and try to get them to feel it, even though they're not the trades people doing the actual hands-on work. Uh, they'll get it once they touch it. So, uh, yeah, I would love to work with you, Jim, more uh, in the future. Uh, uh, and anyone interested, we can do it in Vancouver or we can do it in your community. Great. Well, thanks very much uh, for a great presentation and a great uh, hands-on tour of the, of the lab at BCIT. Um, so we appreciate uh, your time, Alex and Sean, and all your uh, information that you've shared today. Um, there will be a recording of this webinar uh, online in the next week or so. And um, we, uh, we look forward to getting any follow-up from folks who've been on the webinar. If you're look, looking at uh, more hands-on training or, or have ideas, feel free to get in touch with, the, with, with me or with, uh, with our um, uh, instructors today. So thanks very much, everyone, and, and have a great afternoon.